Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's October and the night has slipped down over Broadway, the street is spangled with autumn strollers. They come here, the seekers after something or other, pick a doorway with promising neon, pick a smile and run after it, pick a postcard, write home about it. It's a place to be. You've got to leave your mark. Buy a turtle and have your name painted on its back. Buy a necktie, buy a pillow and send it back to Mom. Sometimes you'll be lucky and get lipstick on your handkerchief. But the odds say you'll buy a newspaper and go to bed. But it's Broadway, kid, and you've had it. And where Broadway ebbs off into the side streets, downtown, where I was, close to where I was, close to where 18th Street touches the river, the shock was a thing composed of crowd and a nighttime sky lit by flame. The elements, later to be noted in police and fire department records, fire at Russell's Chemical Company. Time, 4.15 a.m. You're bringing somebody out now, Dan. Uh, strange. What? What'd you say? I said it's strange, Mugovan. After four in the morning, why should anybody be... Hey, come on, let's see. Put the stretches down here. Somebody better... How are they? Huh? Oh, hello, Danny. These two, I think that's all was in there. I just started to say, somebody better get a priest. They're both dead. This one is. The other one... Danny, is... look at him. Ed Coster. Huh? Do something for him. Don't hey, let... Doc, Doc, over here. Ed Coster. Hurry up, Doc! You know him, Danny? Yeah, he's a policeman. Policeman? What was he doing in there? Doc, do something for him. And the flames beating against the night sky, burning an opening for dawn. In the street, their reflected glow darts across the face of death, holds for an instant, then scurries at the breath of the October wind. This is the time of shadows, the brief time, the time for shrouding of the charred body of a man. It's the time for quick gentleness. And the other man, still in anguish, and the lifting of them into the vehicle reserved for the dead and the dying, the closing of a door upon them, the hushed ride that puts an end tonight. And in the morning at headquarters, watch the sergeant lift a phone, dial a number, and after a silence, ask for news of a man who was known to him, who was a friend. It's me again, Dr. Sinsky. About Ed Coster. Any change? Any? No. Ah, thank you, Doctor. I'll keep calling. Gino. What do you want? Ed, how is he? You heard? No change. Hits us all, Gino. Coster's that kind of man. Ed's been to the Tartaglia house. Dangled a Tartaglia child on his knee. He'll make it. Ed'll make it. Sorry, Danny. I, I keep thinking about Ed's wife, Vera. I, I keep thinking... You got something for me, Gino? Yeah, yeah, I got something. I'm sorry, Danny. The man found with Ed, the dead man. Technical checked up on him. In ways they got to check on such things. Fingerprints, maybe. They know who he is? We got a file on him this long, to my arm. Joe Gant, professional arsonist, a man who sets fires. In this way, he makes his daily bread by burning. Anything else? It's on the record Gant was friends to Frankie Crown. Oh? How were they friends? Gant once lit a playful little bonfire in a machine shop concern. Frankie Crown bailed him out, treated him to Frankie's lawyer. Gant got off. Let's see Frankie get out of this one. I hear Frankie's a big man now. Eh? Not that big. I want to talk to him. Yeah, but maybe you better listen to this other thing first, Danny. What? Was called in a few minutes ago. The automobile of one George Russell exploded, blew up in the face of his daughter Patrice in the driveway with a booby trap. Russell? Of the Russell Chemical Company, where the fire was. Home address, uptown, 1923 East 112. Thanks, Gino. Dr. Sinsky, me again. About Ed, any change, any... No, I'll call again in a little while. Hey, 
Yes? Mr. Russell? Yes, what is it? My name's Clover, police. Oh, morning long, you police. Mind if I come in? I suppose you may. In here. This is my daughter, Patrice, Mr. Clover, another policeman. Hi. How do you feel, Miss Russell? Mm, got my pinching hand in a cast. Oh, the disadvantage of it all. <laughs> Wait till Jimmy sees it. Patrice. It was your fault, Daddy. Wasn't it his fault, Mr. Clover? I understand your car blew up this morning. Well, not mine, his. Daddy's. What happened? Her car is in the garage being repaired. I loaned her mine. You see how it's his fault, Mr. Clover? He spoils me. I only wheedled him for the car this much. This much, and he patted me and said, Yes, my darling daughter. You stepped on the starter and it... And it blew. The way things do, bang, like that, bang. She's a lucky girl. <laughs> Fortunate me. Hand in a sling, gauze on my cheek, and plaster dappled with it. <laughs> Poor Jimmy. Your car booby-trapped, Mr. Russell. Your plant set fire to by an arsonist. An arsonist? That's right. The man who died had a record of arson. What's happening? I, I don't understand. Oh, Pop. Hey, Pop, how's business, Pop? Patrice, you'd better... Do what, Pop? My business is fine, Mr. Clover. You've got any idea I had my Pop place... Pop carries burned. a lot of insurance. Uh, cut it out, Patricia. Look, Mr. Clover. What? Don't pay any attention to her. I know you police have to think along certain lines. If it was arson, what happened to my plant, you've got to think maybe I was the cause of it. Look for reasons. Well, I netted 70000 last year, and this year it's better than ever. To coin a phrase. What am I going to do with you, Patrice? I'm a mess, huh, Daddy? Mr. Russell, there's some connection between the arsonist who was found and a hoodlum named Frankie Crown. Do you know Frankie? Frankie Crown, a hoodlum? Why should I? Look, Mr. Clover, I didn't ask you into my house to listen. I just asked. That's all he did, Pop. I don't know him. Never heard of him. All right. It's fun, huh, Mr. Clover? Hoodlums, arson, booby traps... The nice things that can happen to a modern miss. Oh, brother, wait till Jimmy hears. Tonight's the night he won't be able to shut me up. And consider the girl for a moment. Consider the delight she had found in the touch of horror upon her. Then the intrusion of her father's face, stricken with the sudden fleeting understanding of the girl. Then turning to you, trying to smile, trying to erase the impression his child has made. She's suffering a shock she doesn't understand, Mr. Clark. She doesn't know why. And the girl looks up, laughs at him. <laughs> and leave them like that. <laughs> then to the discreet office of Frankie Crown in a discreet downtown building dedicated to the deep understanding of stocks and bonds and the affairs of commerce. The shiny new setting for Frankie Crown, hoodlum, alley boy, friend of dead arsonists. And Frankie holds out a discreetly manicured hand to have it shaken. Only it doesn't happen to him. Mm -hmm. well, have it your own way, Danny. I thought it would spark something between us if he shook my hand. You're a long way from home, Frankie. Blessed, that's me. I've been blessed. Wipe your hands of the old life and a new world shivers on the horizon waiting just for you. <laughs> you ought to try it, Danny. Been to any good fires lately, Frankie? Oh, busy, 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 busy. Frankie Crown has been so busy you couldn't conceive. No fires, no street dances, no fun anywhere. The penalties of the new life. Dear. A friend of yours was at a fire, though. <laughs> I got crazy friends. They flip over the craziest things. Joe Gant, arsonist. Friend of yours, Frankie. Somewhere in the back of my brain, the name Gant shivers. Uh, help me, then. The consensus is he set a fire early yesterday morning at the Russell Chemical Company. He died in it. Yeah. Yeah. You bailed him out once, favored him with your private lawyer, got him off. Joe Gann. I did all that for him. You got a memory course at headquarters, Frankie. You just signed up. Don't get hard, Danny. Doesn't suit you. I always said about Come you. Come on. The touch of your hand brought it back to me. Gann. Some way he's got a mother. I know because she came to me that time, cried on my sleeve. Please help Joe, she cried. He's a good boy, she cried. Made my eyes water how with my dough and lawyer Joe Gant was going to reform. So I gave in. I break up at a mother's tears. Maybe she'll cry some for me. You going looking for her? 
Oh, don't bother, Danny. I bought her a place in her old country. She impressed me so much as a typical mother. You close all the doors behind you, don't you, Frankie? The mark of a polite man be closed to it. How about the one on George Russell? It come over the tape. The Russell plant burned to the ground. This morning, his car blew up in his daughter's lap. Now, oh, there's a door that's never been open to me, Danny. The Russell door. I'm blessed, huh? Absolutely blessed. You get out of there, back to headquarters, sit at your desk and shuffle your thoughts. The coincidence of a booby-trapped car and a fire. The link between a hoodlum, newly respectable, and an arsonist, newly dead. And another man, a businessman, who had a daughter. You try to find a category for her. You try to find... Danny Clover. Dr. Sinsky, I'm calling from the hospital. How's Ed Coster? Get down here, Danny, right away. And go there. And the only sound in the corridor is your footsteps. A, a sound that hurries toward pain. Open a door and find it. Doctor. He's dead, Danny. Vera. I'm sorry. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In days of old, when knights were bold, King Arthur and his round table were the rage. History's not exactly repeating itself, but the best entertainment of Arthur Godfrey's weekday shows is every Sunday afternoon on King Arthur Godfrey's round table. Listen for it starting tomorrow afternoon on most of these same stations. King Arthur Godfrey's round table on CBS Radio. <laughs> The October wind shrills through Broadway's corridors, sets in motion the light bulbs dangling from twisted, frayed cords, grates the new autumn soot against scarred window panes. And Broadway walks faster now, the wind that slept in the summer warmed rivers awake now and sirens the coming of the cold days, the gray days, the days sodden with autumn's mists. And the corridor people, the doorway people, try to hold back, clutch once more at the sunlit visions that never happened. But the October wind shrieks it out of their hands, pushes it into a corner with the rest of the debris. That's how autumn happens to Broadway, kid. Go fight it. And autumn has other sounds. The lingering overtones that float in from a hospital corridor. A woman's call to a dead husband and... Ed. Ed. Vera... Vera, let me give you something. Let me give... Don't... Don't talk to me. Just for a minute. Don't talk to me. Vera. It's all right now, Danny. Empty. Nothing. There's no more crying left in me. I'll get you something, Vera. Something it says on the bottle that makes you feel better. I told you, Doctor. There's nothing I want. Nothing I need from anyone. Ed was a fine man, Vera. We... You'll miss him? You, Danny? You, Dr. Sinsky? All of you? Vera... They say death comes when... It... They say bitterness won't help. They're dead wrong. It helps. I'll take you home, Vera, then when you... Some other time we'll talk... About Ed? Yes. What's wrong with now, Danny? You can talk to me about Ed now. We never held secrets from each other. I couldn't understand something... What was there about Ed Coster you couldn't understand? Only how he happened to be at the scene of the fire. How he must have been there even before... He was called, Danny. An anonymous call. It told him a fire was being set at that chemical company. It even told him what time to get there. Did he have the call traced? It came from a public phone booth. Ed was new on the burglary squad. He was glad for the tip. 
He thought it would make for a good start on the burglary detail. He thought maybe... He'd been maybe... on the narcotics squad before that, put in for a transfer. Do you know why, Vera? Because I asked him to. Because I didn't like the idea of his being in the narcotics squad. It... It didn't fit Ed. Ed was fine. A good man. He gave me all his love. All his joy. And listen to her until the time comes when your only answer is silence. And not silence quite, because the screaming questions intrude themselves. What is the word to give to a woman whose husband is dead? How do you fill in reports? How do you make a statistic out of it and file it in a ledger? How do you write heartbreak as a number? You don't know how. So you turn your back on it. Leave. And to headquarters again. Call in Detective Muggerman. Tell him to get out the record of Ed Coster. And wait. And a while later, a door opens and Detective Muggerman walks in. I got it, Danny. Okay, put it down. Aren't you going to look at it? What's the matter, Muggerman? You're restless? I'll look at it. I know you will, but I think you ought to look at it right away. Look, Muggerman, you... All right, then I'll show you. Hey, you see it? Here. This arrest, June 12th this year. Patrice Russell. Uh-huh. Ed arrested her for the possession of narcotics. Now you know why I wanted you... Take it, Muggerman. Lieutenant Clover's office, Muggerman speak. What? Bad? Oh, sure, sure, right away. Danny. Uh-huh? A bomb was thrown into the home of George Russell. When? A few minutes ago into the living room. The fire department... Let's go. I checked with the boys in the fire department. You looked yourself? Yeah, Danny, I did. There's no one else in the house. Just him, you and me. You ask about his daughter? woman in the crowd outside told me she saw her go out a couple of hours ago. Described her wearing apparel right up to her hat. The woman in the crowd leans out her window and notices things like that about her neighbors. You make a note of what the girl was wearing? It happens to me like a reflex now, Danny. They tried to kill Russell once before. This time they made it. Can't we go into another room and talk, Danny? The way it hit him at the... In a minute. He must have been sitting at this window. The force of the explosion threw him... Yeah, like that. They sure wanted him dead, didn't they? Then routine. Put it on the teletype for all the precincts. Have men go to places where a girl like Patrice Russell might be. Wait. Patrice Russell is at none of these places. Then an all-points bulletin, find Patrice Russell. And more routine. Out of your office, down two flights of steps, down a corridor, open a door. And for all that effort, a man named Gordon greets you. Close the door, Lieutenant. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. Don't you ever open a window in here, Gordon? For fresh air? You need fresh air, Lieutenant? Oh, poor you. Down here in technical, you're hermetically sealed. Take a whiff, Lieutenant. Hermetic, hmm? About the fire at the Russell Chemical Company. I've been sitting here for two hours watching the door, waiting for you to scrape in here, Lieutenant. You need Gordon again, don't you? Look, Gordon... Don't raise your voice, Lieutenant. I'm a civilian technician. I don't have to bow my head and shuffle my feet when you talk to me. Next time you walk in here, say to yourself, don't raise your voice to Gordon. What about the report? Nicely phrased. Here. Oh. In case the three-syllable type words make you scratch your head in utter dismay, I'd better tell you. The fire was not only set by an arsonist, but there was an explosion. Explosive neatly placed to explode at a comparatively low heat. It was a... Danny, I got a morsel for you. You close the door. Close it yourself. Let's get out of here, Gino. I said... I heard what you said. Come on, Gino. What have you got? Patrice Russell. Detective Fuller spotted her in the village. She climbed the stair and went to a party at 1212 Bank Street, where she is at this moment. Thanks, Gino. (laughs) 
Where's Patrice Russell? Thanks. Patrice. Cut in, Danny. Cut in. Come on, dance with me. Come to me, Danny. Come to me. Come on, we're getting out of here, Patrice. Cut in. Where will we go? Just away from here. I've got to talk to you. My car's outside. I know a lovely place to talk. Outside in the halls, far enough. Halls are trapped. Come on. Or you'll bruise me. <laughs> All right, come on. Let's go out in the hall. Here? Here. For what? Your father's dead. You kidding? No, you're not, are you? How? Someone tossed a bomb in your living room. Poor Dad. Poor Daddy. Who did it, Patrice? Honest, I, I don't know. Poor Daddy. I loved him, you know. I, I really did. But he loved you. I know. I know he did. Patrice. I, I wasn't very nice to him, Daddy. You know something? Every morning I, I'd wake up and say to myself, this is a day that I'm not going to hurt Daddy. And it never worked out. I want to ask you something, Patrice. Because I never tried. Around breakfast time, I'd think of something to do, and, and during the day, I'd find out a way to do it. What about the narcotics? What? The narcotics. Oh, no more, Danny. I promised him that. And I kept my promise. I took the cure, and it worked. I haven't touched it since. Not since that detective picked me up for it. His name is Ed Costa, Patrice. He died because of that fire at your father's place. I'm sorry. Listen, Danny, about the narcotics. I want you to know it's all over. It lost me everything. I had a boy. We were going to get married. And he's gone. You know what I do now? I go to parties. Like this. Goodbye, Danny. And leave her, leave Greenwich Village, ride uptown to the one stop you had to make, the final stop, in front of a canopied entrance to a Greystone apartment house. Have your badge sniffed at and be told the man you're looking for is a penthouse dweller. Find the elevator, press a button, because the man you want is 30 floors away. Get there, and the man you want is waiting for you as you step out. Hey, come on in, Danny. Thanks. Yeah, like Frankie's new house, Danny? Classic. Yeah. Wait till I show you outside. I got the city for an awning. Come on, I'll show you. All right. My Manhattan Tower, Danny. I'm happy for you. You uh, figure on renting a place like this? That's why you come to look? Uh-uh. And a what? I want to take you away from all this, Frankie. <laughs> Too much sweat got me here, Danny. It isn't going to be easy. Not hard. Just a walk to the elevator and a ride downtown. Uh -uh. There were times when that could happen to Frankie no more. It's going to happen. It's got murder in it. What are you talking about? George Russell. What about him? Dead. Had a bomb pitched through his living room window. Rumor said you used to do things like that, Frankie. Uh -uh. Rubber balls through tenement windows when I was a kid. I'd give it up. No future. It all gets back to Joe Gant, Frankie. Come on, Danny. You're in a classy place. Make classy conversation. What about you again? The connection between you and who? Finish the visit, Danny. I got a day. It'll wait. Maybe I can still catch it, Danny. Maybe she's got a friend. You want me to try? Don't bother. Well, let's finish the visit. Sure. Started way back in June. What did, Danny? Come on, come on. When Patrice you? Russell was picked up on a narcotics charge. George Russell, Patrice Russell. What is it with all these Russells? George Russell must have pleaded to the officer not to press charges against his daughter, Patrice. He didn't make it. The charge nearly wrecked his daughter. All right. What's this got to do with me? The arresting officer's name was Ed Coster. Russell was going to get back at him. <sighs> Danny. And he found a way to do it. Somehow he found out Coster was transferred from narcotics to burglary. That was his chance. That's my date, Danny. I don't like to keep a lady waiting. Tough. See? She's impatient. Tough. I'm telling a story. Russell came to you. He said he wanted a fire set in his place for whatever reason he gave you, for whatever amount he gave you. Look, Danny... You better forget it. So you arranged it, sent Joe Gant. Joe set the fire all right, but he was followed by Officer Ed Coster. Because Ed got a phone call telling him where a burglar would be at what time. All right, so they both burned... 
Why should that keep me from a date? The phone call to Ed came from Russell. Russell rigged the place to blow up when the fire started. It blew all right. Gant was killed. Ed died. And I wipe a tear with the back of my hand. You couldn't let Russell get away with that. One of your boys was killed. Bad for your reputation. You evened it. The bomb in the car didn't work, but the bomb in the living room did. Danny. You can say goodbye to her on your way, Frankie. I asked you, Danny. You didn't agree. It killed you. Put down that gun. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to get to say goodbye to her, Frankie. She went away. Broadway is wearing its harlequin clothes. It winks an eye and beckons. And in the press of crowd there, the pale girl walks like a queen because Broadway's a dream street. And there, that man with begging eyes, hungry for a new dream. It's a laugh or a cry with nothing in between. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Anthony Barrett was heard as Frankie Crown. Featured in the cast were Michael Ann Barrett, Paula Winslow, Herb Butterfield, and Ed Max. My friend Irma is everybody's friend Irma. There's something downright appealing in that gal's goofy mentality. And every Sunday evening, Marie Wilson stars as the world's most adorable dumbbell, my friend Irma. Kathy Lewis is her level-headed roommate on most of these stations Sunday nights. Enjoy CBS Radio's My Friend Irma. Bill Anders speaking. And remember, the Frankie Lane Show is your date for slick syncopation every Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network. (laughs) 